Rangers fans, welcome to Liberty Blue, the essential New York Rangers podcast. I'm Andrew Chonley alongside Nick Zararis. Nick, this is the best team in hockey, huh? They keep finding ways to win. If guys like Johnny Brodzinski are going to come up and turn into Jerome McGinley for two weeks, I, I don't think there's anything else you can complain about. It, it's just a testament to the power of confidence. I, I know we talk a lot about, well, what can we measure? What can we see? The numbers of comparing this year's team to last year's team, they're not that different underlying results wise, but the energy around the team is noticeably different. And that's why I feel a lot different about this team as opposed to the group from last year is they keep finding ways to win. They're getting contributions from all over the lineup. Guys like Jimmy VZ are chipping in. Guys like Johnny Brodzinski are chipping in. You got Panarin moving like an all world type player right now. The defense is starting to kind of shake out now that Fox is kind of gotten a couple games to get himself back in the lineup, get back up to game speed. They can kind of jot everyone down a spot, get a little more level there. That should, in theory, tighten up the defense, which I know has been a topic, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But face value, it's just a testament to what good energy around your team can do. They're not this good. That No team in hockey is, you know, 18-4-1 good. No one is. But if you got good vibes and you got enough talent, you can play like you're this good. Well, the Bruins were last season, but you know, don't don't let's not mention how that season ended for them. Let's not let's not talk about that. But yeah, I mean, the the, the defense was a little bit shaky over this past week, especially against San Jose. It wasn't pretty, it, especially when it was six three. I think it was after I think Keandre Miller scored that sixth goal, and then the Rangers were like, "Oh, this game is over." And San Jose with the, with the David Quinn Super Bowl. David Quinn. David Quinn was like, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, wait, hold on, hold on, everybody, hold on. I'm still here. I still need to win this game. I still have bills to pay." So the the Sharks almost Sharks almost almost brought that one back, but the the Rangers kind of it. Again, we talk about the timeouts. The Sharks scored two goals. It was six five, and Peter Laviolette. Their timeout. Peter Laviolette called a timeout. He's like, "Hold on, can everybody remember? This is still uh, we're, we're still got four minutes left to play in this game. Can, can we just?" Can we start playing like we're a team again? And the, and the Rangers were like, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, we should, we should, we should kind of do that, huh?" And then they did that, and then they won the game. Gerard Gallant would have not done that, and genuinely, like I, I don't, you know, it. I don't want to bring up Gerard Gallant when the team is eighteen four to one. All these things, but that timeout would not have gotten called, and I kind of am of the belief that the Sharks would have tied that game. So. The the Rangers they they didn't have the greatest of weekends defensively, but you know what? It didn't matter because they won. They don't ask you how; they ask you how many. The Rangers right now, despite all of the the little flaws and the little things that they're that they're that the uh, uh, the opponents are kind of finding in in their game, especially with the past couple of games, doesn't matter right now. The Rangers say, you know, find our flaws. It doesn't matter because we're just going to outscore you anyway. I don't know how that's going to be sustainable long term. And again. 18 4 and 1 is is the kind of record that you have in NHL 24. You don't really you don't often see this kind of record in reality, but especially in hockey. I mean, you see it in basketball and things like that, but in hockey it's a very rare record to have. This is the good times, man. We got to enjoy it while we're here. It's a testament to their depth. You, you mentioned it in regards to basketball where it you can have, you know, the 61 season in basketball not easily, but it's it's feasible. It's not out of the realm of possibility because you only need, you know, seven, eight guys in your rotation. And then you go two, three more guys down than that. But generally speaking, you're running about an eight person, nine person bench during your regular season in the NBA hockey. You need all 18 of those guys and the goalie to be moderate contributors on some level. Not just one. You need both of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, Just speaking on a night tonight, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you do need good goaltending and they've gotten that by by and large from quick quick wasn't great against san jose but he was fu- he was good enough that not his fault the game again they were in some weird games i know i was talking about this with somebody earlier today in relation to just what they're conceding and the counterpoint i have to that is you got to look at the context of these games where they're conceding you know four and a half five expected goals against where they get out to big leads like the detroit game where they're up five nothing so, okay, if the other team scores a couple, they're going to they're gonna have the puck a lot more, Detroit is, in a game where they're down 5 nothing than they are in a 1-1 game. So I understand that. The, the concern, I think, and it's not just specific to that, I think the concern a lot of people have is they feel that the Rangers are going to get into a bad habit of just thinking they can outscore their defensive woes, especially because the power play is going as good, it is, as, good as it is, and that's something else I want to hit on is that they have elite special teams right now. But as far as right now, the the 
the big thing I'm thinking about is where is the first rough patch going to come? Because it has to come at some point, unless they're going to be the Bruins from last year, in which case the rough patch will be the first round of the playoffs. But for <laughs> our, for argument's sake, because when you look at it, the big my my thought my thought process is finishing in uh, save percentage wise, they're about where they were last year in respect. They were, last year their save percentage was one percent higher, and their shooting percentage was one percent higher. Right now, they're at 8.76 shooting percentage and 91.94 save percentage. So pretty close to what they were last year at five on five. Those That doesn't tell you like, hey, maybe they're going to go on a cold streak or a hot streak. This is kind of where they're supposed to be as far as their their PDO, their puck luck, if you will. This is about where they're supposed to be. Because generally speaking, when we're looking for things that could become an issue – like, yeah, they're conceding a lot defensively, but those aren't actually resulting in a ton of goals against. Yeah, they're getting out expected goals in these games where they get out to big leads or they get in, they get close, get, they're in games where they're trailing f- most of the game and they're trying to come back where they're going to concede stuff because they're cheating offensively, kind of like the Buffalo game on Monday, where, yeah, the final score was really ugly of the Buffalo game, but that wasn't a 5-1 hockey game. I, anybody watching that could tell you that. that. That's really what I'm looking for right now is trying to understand what that first bump, what that first real issue is going to be, because you would have thought it would have been the injuries, but they went 7-2-1 and one without Adam Fox, so it didn't really seem like that was much of an issue. And not only that, you you saw the Buffalo game, and yeah, the five to one score doesn't really tell you how the game actually went. But it's one thing to have that kind of game, and then you at, also at home, it, it'd be one thing if you went to Buffalo and that happened. You're like, oh, it's it's a road trip, you know, whatever these things happen. But you get, I don't want to say embarrassed, but like Buffalo took advantage of all their opportunities and the Rangers got goalied essentially the Rangers had a couple they had a post in there yeah, they, right. had they, two, they got goalie really they looks. got unlucky it is what it is but the score the score if you read it is doesn't look too, doesn't look too good so you come off a game like that Shesterkin after the game was was you know trying to break his stick like he wasn't happy about it the team wasn't happy most teams I feel like after that would I would try to to you know perform better some of them would fail. The Rangers dominated Detroit. Yeah. Like the score was 3 2. The, the Rangers, like that game was never close, genuinely. The Rangers dominated for like the entire game. It was, it, and that is one of the more in, impressive things about this core right now under Peter Laviolette and, and the coaching staff is this at, the Rangers lose at home, and then they turn around 48 hours later and deliver a dominant performance. Now, Detroit's a good team. We don't like to think of it that way because Detroit has been a dumpster fire for the past few years, but they are, right now, either a playoff team or a wildcard team or in that mix. They're they're a solid NHL team. Right, right. The Rangers dominated. That is objectively impressive from this core that they took a loss like that against Buffalo, turned it around and won again, three, two, you take a look at the score and you go, Oh, that was a close game. And you know, it, whatever. But if you actually just watch the game for you, you forget about the analytics for a second, just, just watch the game and you'll see the Rangers had the puck in the offensive zone for the vast majority of that game. So it's very impressive to me that they took a bump in the road like that and they said, oh, it's fine. We'll just dominate the next game and win. And then they did. And then they went to Nashville. The first period was one of the periods of all time. I got to tell you, wasn't pretty. But again, they took that first period and then they won the game. They won the game again. San Jose, bad team, but they beat New Jersey. They, they've been looking a lot better since conceding 10 goals back in back-to-back games. Duclair scored first on that breakaway. It wasn't looking good. The Rangers came back and won that game. So I don't know where the, where the bump in the road is going to be, but we've seen smaller ones up until this point, and the Rangers have almost ignored them. Like that's that. It's very impressive. In regards to that, you mentioned that. I, I think that's really why I feel really good about this team is it doesn't feel like they're ever out of any of these games. Like I was at the Buffalo game last Monday and even at two, nothing, I was like, all right, they get one with 10, 11 minutes to go. They're right back in this. And they made a good push at two to one. So I think that is a good indication of the confidence that 
I have, and I know a lot of people are feeling about this team where all it takes is one power play opportunity. Then they're right back in it. I mean, they're, they're scoring at a 30% clip on the man advantage. I mean, the all time record for a season is 32%. And the Oilers did that last year. The Rangers probably won't stay at 30. They'll probably end up somewhere 25, 26%, but this is a really good power play. And that can solve a lot of issues, but the thing that's good about it this year is that is not solving all of their issues. This isn't like the last couple of years where the power play was basically all they had to erase a lot of their issues. They are getting really good special teams in addition to their penalty kills also at like 84, 85%, something like that. League average right now is about 78%. So when you're above league average on your special teams and both units, You've got really good goaltending. I don't know if Quick is still in the top 10, but I know Igor is in a goal saved above expected. Your five on five play is okay. It's not elite. They're, they're about middle of the table. They're like 15th, 16th in that ballpark for chances for, chances against. But the bones, the, the game. They're not in the f- bottom tier, yes. which is something that we haven't been mentioning before in previous seasons. They were it two, was- two years ago, they were. 24 25 like that last year they were like 19 20 ish so right like they're making incremental improvement it's really important and again we the the ideal and everything is to be the best in 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 you know in all fields the best five on five the best power play the best penalty kill the best everything else one of the biggest red flags rangers have had in prior seasons was okay their power play is good their penalty kill is good but at five on five they are awful 15th in the league isn't great, but comparatively, pass but compared to what the Rangers were at five on five before, it's better. We're not, you know, we're not talking about, oh my, like this team can't do anything at five on five. This is, this is terrible. What's going on there? They're, they're waiting for the refs to essentially give them the road to winning the game. The Rangers now. They're still kind of relying on on their special teams, but it's a it's a lot better now than what it was, which I think goes into which is a big part of what goes into our confidence level of this team. It's not just hey refs call this penalty so that we can score our only goals. It's okay. Well, we can dominate you on the power play. We can dominate you on the penalty kill, but also we're not schmucks when it comes to five on five right now either. Yeah, no, looking at the numbers right now, last year it was 54.6 scoring chances per 60. This year it's 58.5. Last year was 55 chances against. This year it's 60 chances against, which tells you they're conceding a little bit more defensively, but it's at the expense to create more offense. Quality-wise, same thing. 2.55 2.55 expected goals last year, 2.62 expected goals this year. And then against 264 against 268 against this year, 264 last year. So that tells you they are actively conceding more defensively, but they are creating more offensively. And one of the big drivers of that this year has been the fact that Jacob Truba and K. Andre Miller are not a disaster like they were last year. I, I know I've said the stat more than once on the podcast this season. But prior to the All-Star break last year, Jacob Truba and Ke'Andre Miller were a 42% goal share. Not expected goal, goal share. So of all the goals that happened when those two were on the ice, the Rangers scored 42% of them, which is not a good ratio for what is supposed to be your best defensive, your shutdown matchup, whatever you want to call it, your shutdown pair. This year, they're about, I want to say 47, 48%, which, you know, you'd like that to be over 50, but that's a lot better. But the big reason... Troop has been better this year, it, apart from actually being healthy, which, you know, that's another that's a different part of the conversation. But actually being healthy, the Rangers and, are just a lot- also if he is not healthy, he's not playing. Which yeah. wasn't which wasn't the case under a certain special special man behind the behind the bench before. No. And so the big my my theory as to why Troop is playing better is efficiency. He's shooting less than he has the last two years, which. Anytime you are not taking that shot from the point, you are helping your offense because that's not an efficient play. Every now and then you want that shot to keep the defense honest. You can look for rebounds, deflections. That's something that it jumped out to me as well. looking at his underlying numbers, he's generating more rebounds this year than he has in years past off of his shots. So that tells you he's being a little bit more selective. He's getting the pucks to better areas. His individual expected goals, which are just his are up a tick as well, which all supports the idea. He's being a little more selective. And the other thing that I, 
I, I can't believe it took me this long to put this t- together. Uh, the other reason his numbers are a lot better is because he's been playing with Panarin a lot, and that and Panarin's a hard trophy guy right now. <laughs> that That's the big reason why Truba's numbers are better, frankly, that he's playing with one of the best lines in all of hockey with him, Lafreniere and Trocek right now. So that's making up for a lot of issues. And in years past, the Rangers have had to put Adam Fox with Panarin to kind of tilt the ice. Right now, they have the luxury of separating them. When you can play Fox with either Zabinijad or with the third line, that is going to help you out. When you have the ability to separate your good players, we talk about this a lot into the relation to the Rangers, why they don't play Zabinijad with Panarin, why the Bruins stop playing Marshawn with uh, Pasternak. You got to try and sit, split up your good players. That way you have more quality throughout your lineup. The Rangers right now, ha- because their defense has been better, have the luxury of separating them where they don't have to play Fox with Panarin to tilt the ice. Because Panarin's so good, they can take the drop off of going from Fox Lindgren to Truba Miller And it's not that big of a deal because that's how good the forwards have been. That's something that's encouraging that they haven't had in years past is even though Zabinjad and Kreider haven't scored a ton at five on five, they're not getting killed at five on five. They're generating chances. The puck luck's starting to go. Zabinjad and Kreider are finding the score sheet more. But the distribution of offense is more equitable throughout the lineup. And that's something the Rangers just haven't had. Yeah, I mean, I know that the the analytics suggest that Jacob Truba is kind of the same player that he was in previous years, but just watching him play, he just looks more comfortable. Whether the whether the results follow that or or not is one thing, but just from a vibe perspective and just watching how he reacts to things going on in his end of the ice he gen he generally looks a lot more comfortable than he did in in any of the other years that he's been here he he's he knows where Kendra miller is a lot more of the time which if you just watch him play last season he a lot of times he lost where miller is or lost where he was on the ice in relation to what was going on he did he didn't seem like he was fully aware of what was going on but now this year Again, analytics aside for a second, he generally looks a lot more confident in one, understanding where Miller is, two, understanding where he's supposed to be in relation to what's going on in the defensive in the defensive end. And also, I feel like he's a little bit more confident with the puck in the defensive end now as well. The stretch passes have have, have been have been there. Overall, I think the analytics will will improve if he continues to play this way. He's gotten a lot better. And I love this. Like, you know, if you follow me on Twitter at Chelney Andrew, C-H-E-L-N-E-Y Andrew, you'll know that prior to this season, I was not shy about highlighting Jacob Chuba's mistakes. This season, haven't done that because he has, I mean, from, from what I've watched of him, he's getting burned one-on-one a lot less. He seems to just have a much better awareness of what is happening in the defensive end and it's looked a lot better. And I think the, I think the analytics will, will follow as a result of that. The big thing I want to emphasize in this conversation, it's, it's getting a little nebulous here. We are kind of getting in the weeds, but the point I want to emphasize is just because somebody gets out chanced, whether it be expected goals or qual- quantity of chances, like just more total chances, that doesn't necessarily mean they're an ineffective hockey player. It means they have, they don't have the puck as much and they're defense first But in addition to, you know, the numbers being about the same, Truba is also blocking significantly more shots than he has at any other point in his entire career, not just as his time as a Ranger. So even if they are getting out chance, those chances aren't getting all the way through. And one last point on this before we move on. The other thing they have working for them this year that they did last year was Igor came out of the gate slow last year. Last year, it took him till about midway, mid-December to kind of get going to be the Igor we know he is. And that's reflected in the on-ice save percentage. Last year, this time, it was about 895, 899, I want to say, something like that. And right now, it's like 9 Halak also was not Halak took a while to get going as well. Point, yeah. yeah, they both took a while to get going as well. And when you have good goaltending, that can mask a lot of issues. That also plays into the confidence the team has, where right now they feel like, whether it's Quick, whether it's Shesterkin, God forbid if it's Louis Domingue again, they still feel like they could win. Hey, they, hey, hey, they, they, he won his only start now. Hey, 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 he's, he's undefeated as a Rangers legend, Nick. I don't know if you know. 
I saw somebody shamelessly put him in the graphic of how good the Rangers are playing, how good the Rangers goalies have been. Like he hasn't played one game. Like I like I get it. You, you're trying to get your you're trying to get your numbers, but like he played one game. I, like I don't even count quick in the rank in the leaders for goals saved above expected because he doesn't have enough starts. Like let, let's let's have our arguments and be logical here. Let's use context. Yeah, the guy who only has six starts is going to have better numbers than guys who have eleven or twelve. Counterpoint. Just- Counterpoint. Nick, raise the jersey. Raise the jersey that are after. Is Louis Domingue. That's all I'm saying. Hey man, there's probably some there's probably some world where he ends up with a really really mediocre TikTok sponsorship from some Chinese restaurant somewhere in Connecticut, and he has a sp- a, a Louis Domingue spicy pork dish on the menu named after him. <laughs> so that's the highlight. Speaking of Connecticut, yeah, Johnny Brodzinski doesn't want to go back. No, <laughs> no, he's looked really good too. It's really remarkable because this is a guy who's 30 years old and I want to say has like 200 career NHL games at this point. If I remember correctly, I'm pulling up his hockey DB right now. But yeah, when you're 30, yeah, he's 30 years old. He was a fifth round pick in 2013. He has 105 career NHL games before, including what he's played this year. The last time he played more than 20 games in a season at the NHL level was two years ago. And he's only done that twice in his career. I don't know how sustainable this is. I also had somebody point out to me he was leading the AHL in scoring. So, like, I don't know if, like, he just, like, stumbled into some radioactive waste and got superpowers or well, something. Well, responding to that really quickly, because on the broadcast, they t- they they talked to Johnny Brzezinski, and he mentioned, or I think, like, they talked to him during the broadcast, or they talked to him before the, yeah, 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 before yeah. the game, and he was talking about how he completely changed his his summer workout plan. He like he really focused on his skating, and he like he he changed a bunch of things, changed a bunch of things around, and now this is the result. Whether or not that's sustainable will is is one thing that we'll keep an eye on. But he changed some things around, and it's clearly working. I mean, not only is he performing ad- admirably in the in you know in the in the interim here of being on the Rangers, like he's making well. a case for him to stay. Like that's yeah. that's how good he's been. Yeah, no, I was always of the opinion that I didn't understand why he didn't get more looks, considering they've had him in the organization for three years, including this year, and they've done the revolving door of fourth line guys. And I never thought he had great puck skills or anything, but he skated relatively fast in a straight line and his effort was never questioned. I mean, there are worse things you could have from a fourth liner, and I'm glad it's working for him. I mean, like I said, the Rangers have done a lot of different things to try and find fourth liners, but... This guy's been wasting away in Hartford, Connecticut, and he's stump- he's in the lineup and he's been effective. I mean, to your point, I, I, he's not going to keep putting up you know a point per game, sure. but he's gonna he's making a strong case to be a, a top nine forward. Where maybe they don't need to go out and add a top nine forward at the deadline. Maybe it's just a fourth line or an extra defenseman or something like that. These are good problems to have. I mean, I do I do still think they need a right winger for sure. I, I think I think that's kind of the problem area for them right now. And also, John, and I tweeted this last night also that Johnny Brzezinski looking the way that he does, Barkley Goudreau was already expendable, especially with that contract coming in. But this, like this, makes I at, I I would hope and at least think that Chris Drury watched that game in the in the boot, you know, in the in the box last night, and and he watched it. He goes, Johnny Brzezinski is like kind of. Is is he just a cheaper Brooklyn Goudreau? Is that what's going on? Like, should we get rid of you know? Like, I, I don't know if this conversation was had. I was not sitting next to Chris Jury feeding them this information, so I can't I can't tell you one way or the other whether or not that it was going on. But it it Brzezinski's play right now is making Barclay Goudreau even more expendable than he already was, given his contract and given where he's playing the lineup right now. But it, but all of this depends on whether or not Johnny Brzezinski can continue to play this way. Obviously, he's not going to put up, you know, point a game and all these things. But if he continues to play the exact the same way that he has been, well, then somebody's going to have to come out once Kako comes back or when Hedl comes back or you know. And right now, this probably it probably has to be Goudreau. He looks the part. 
Johnny Brzezinski does not look like an AHL call up. He yep. looks pretty comfortable. He looks fast enough to keep up with NHL play. That's really encouraging stuff that the guys they've called up from, from I almost called it triple a like baseball, but <laughs> the guys they call up from Hartford are, are, are comfortable enough where even if it's only for a week or two, they're getting enough out of them where it's not a net negative net negative. I mean, we we've we've done a decent amount of Blake Wheeler discourse, but thankfully that seems to have died down as the team has played well because people are realizing, hey, he's the ninth or tenth forward. It's not that big of a deal. Like right now, the real concerns are just how the real concern is what being this good this early means because there are a couple schools of thought. We we talked about it in relation to the Bruins. We've done that more than once last year where they hit no adversity all regular season. They lost two games in overtime to Matthew Kachuk and then they got to a game seven and they didn't look good. Or are they going to hit a patch where they lose, you know, six out of 10, where they lose a couple in overtime, stuff like that, where it's not necessarily, hey, the sky is falling, but they're not this good. I, I don't think they can possibly keep playing at this level, but weirder shit has happened. I mean, when you have guys like Panarin playing as good as they are, and you still have Zabinijad and Kreider who definitely still have another level to get to, it's really easy to kind of talk yourself into this the way we have been the last few weeks. I keep saying on the show, I'll say it again. We are in the good times. And it's don't just, say that because that tells me the good that they end. Hey, well, I, I don't, well, well, well the, the good times end when they win the Stanley Cup in June. Isn't that right, Nick? Ha ha ha. But like, it, it's just it's just one of those things where you hockey is a weird, silly, stupid sport where good teams lose eight in a row or, you know, whatever. Like they, they go on these cold streaks where they're hitting nine posts a game and all of these easy shots are just missing the net for some reason and the people are gripping their sticks and it's, you know, hockey like hockey is just a, a very luck-dependent sport, more so than any of the other major sports in America. Th- that might happen to the Rangers at some point where they just hit four posts and then they just lose 4-3 because they just hit all these posts. And next game, same kind of thing where they lose 2-1 to one because a cross ice pass that was a, as crispy as it could possibly make it, it just, the whoever gets the pass shoots it over the top of the net and that's the game. These things can happen. But for right now, the Rangers are just, they're, they're just cruising. They, they're cruising right now. It is, is, they're just a fun team to watch. Whether you're a Rangers fan or not, objectively they're just a fun team to just put on the tv like they they they, a lot of teams i don't want to say are boring kind of for the most part might be the rangers are not one of those teams where regardless of which game it is they're they're a fun watch and just keep the good times rolling baby there are a lot of teams in the nhl that want to every game to be two to two and they want to get to overtime and then get to the shootout. So they have ah. as little risk as possible. There are right. a lot of teams that play like that. Well, there's that another the New York team that does that. I don't know if you know yeah. that, Nick. Oh yeah, no, the Islanders are one of my favorite teams to watch because every single game happens the exact same way. They score three <laughs> goals in the first 15 minutes of the game. They don't score again. And then they desperately try and hold on over the final 45 minutes of the game. It's really kind of remarkable how like they've got it down to a science to lose every game in overtime. Yeah, the Lane Lambert special. But yeah, yeah it, ridiculous. I don't, to a certain extent, I understand the thought process of collecting as many points as you can that way. But it, a lot of that, the Rangers did last season and the last couple of seasons where all they have to do is hang on, just hang on. And then they're, and then somebody will, and then power play or somebody, you know, the top line guy will deliver and all, and all is well. That kind of hanging on by the seat of your pants and just hoping things go well for your team doesn't usually end well. It's usually the the teams that are driving the you know steering the ship that end up winning the the important games. Yeah, you can. The, the, this is the thing. That kind of mentality wins you games in the regular season, but they don't win you anything after April. And the the Rangers right now are are not playing that way. The Rangers are playing the way the style of hockey that wins you games come May and June. All right, Andrew, it's time to play Guess Who. Oh, boy. All right. Okay. This player played for the Columbus Blue Jackets, Uh the Colorado Avalanche, the New York Rangers, the Boston Bruins, the Vegas Golden Knights, and the Ottawa Senators. Oh, boy. Okay. It's a lot of teams. Six teams, yes. Okay. Is he currently on the team? He is currently still in the league, yes. He's not on the Rangers. 
Okay. Is he on the Senators? He's still on the Senators, yes. Okay. It's a lot of teams. For some reason, okay, I'm, am I cheating if I pull up dailyfaceoff.com right now? Yes, you are. Okay, that's cheating. All right, I won't do that. Uh, what? He played for the Rangers. I, I like. I hate these. I hate these games because I'm never prepared for them. I always. I always. I always. There's look, no way to be prepared. I for look this. ridiculous every every time because I'm sure. I'm sure people that are listening. They're like, "Oh yeah, this is so easy. How could you not know this?" But I'm sitting here like, uh, 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 I don't. I don't. Uh, forward. No. Oh, Nick Holden. There you go. Yeah. See, it took you a minute, uh, but you yeah. got there. You got there. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I for, I forget he's still playing sometimes, and then I and then I look back and I go, oh yeah, he is he's still here. All right, Andrew. The next thing we're gonna do. This is a little. We haven't done something like this before, but this is something I th- saw people do in relation to NFL stuff, and it'll translate well here. You and I are going to get five draft picks each. We okay. are going to select guys on the premise of trying to win as many NHL awards as possible. So you can take if you want, you know, if you want to try and definitely get a defenseman so you definitely get the Norris right. Okay, you could do that. If you want to do goalies and you definitely want to try and get the Vesna right, you can do that. If you want to be a generalist and take like two forwards, two defensemen and a goalie, you could do that as well. So I will be courteous because I didn't prep you and I will let you have the first pick. I'm just picking like just players. In the any league? player. Yes. Any, okay, fi- uh, any right, player. Well, We're going McDavid back and forth. One. Okay, so Connor McDavid won. Okay. Even without the bet, even with the rough head start, even with the Connor fact he's going to be playing catch up. Because he's going to score a thousand points. Okay. From this Fair point enough. on, he's, he's just going to keep scoring. All right. Yeah. I'll take McCarr. So I definitely get the Norris, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll just give me Panarin for the heart, I guess. Okay. Panarin for the heart. I will, in that case, I will go. I was going to say Elias Pedersen. That's fun. I'll take Elias Pedersen. I enjoy watching the Canucks if it's another person to root for. Okay. 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 Well, so got- if you're taking Pedersen, I'll take Thatcher Demko for Vesna. That's a good shout. That's a good shout. Uh, I will. I'll do it. I don't. I hate taking Rangers in anything, but I'll take Shesterkin. Sure. Okay. I'll take. Uh, I'll take Adam Fox. Okay. That's a pretty solid. You def. Fox is always going to run into the issue of, you know, it's him and McCarr and then yeah. Quinn Hughes is having a great year and Charlie McAvoy is having a good year, but it's always going to be one of those five guys. Mir Heiskin and you sure. can throw in there as well, but it's always going to be one of those four or five guys. Yeah. I mean, okay. your turn. Okay. So I have a defenseman, a forward, a goalie. I will take, give me Kucherov who's been on mm. fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm going to be a generalist here, take a second defenseman. I'll just take Quinn Hughes. That's a good shout. I mean, yeah. I, I, it, I have two Canucks on my team, and they're both playing super, super, super well. Quinn Hughes is playing on the Makar Fox level right now. He's been that good to start this season. It's it's really remarkable what the Canucks have done this year. Yeah, yeah. I, well, Demko has been easily the best goalie on the planet it, to start the season. I mean, he is his, not just his stat you know goals say you know goals his save percentage and all these like basic stats his analytics are just in the the bluest of the blue the pluses of the pluses he has been dominant to, to you know through the today is december 4th through today he's been the best goalie on the planet and if he just maintains this or at least comes close to it he it will run away with the Vezna. so that's why i picked him all right, my last pick, I will be – I'm also going to load up on forwards here. I'm going to end up with three, but give me McKinnon. One of him or Rantanen is going to end up in the top five of voting because they're both playing incredible. Yeah, is that I, – I picked five, right? Yeah, you picked five. Okay. Yeah, you have McDavid, Panarin, Demko, Fox, Quinn Hughes. I have yeah. McCarr, Pedersen, Shesterkin, Kucherov, McKinnon. So we both have five. You went 2D. I only went one because I feel like I get – I feel like McCarr is going to always put up the number, and that's going to be the argument. He's going to run into the same thing LeBron does. I know we did this conversation in regards to McDavid before the season when we were talking about preseason awards, but it feels like the NHL voters don't do that. I feel like the NHL voters will just give it to you nine times if you – if you have the stats. <laughs> yeah, they also don't like if it's too obvious then they won't do it, which is the weirdest aspect yeah. of, of NHL awards. Like last season when Eric Carlson should not have won the Norris just because of points, but they did it anyway because of points. Like 
Sorokin should have won the Vez- should have won the Vesna because if without him the Islanders win four games. But they didn't do that. They gave it to Olmark because the Bruins were that good. Like, all you know, not to take away from Olmark, he played very well for sure, and yeah, he he deserves to be in the conversation a hundred times out of a hundred. But without Sorokin, the Islanders literally are the Sharks. So. I feel like Sorokin deserved it, but all good doesn't matter. But yeah, I mean the the award voting is always just I don't want to say a coin flip because some like they occasionally get it right. The the when when Adam Fox won the Norris that year, and I yeah I get it. Oh Rangers fans talking about Adam Fox winning the Norris. Oh what a surprise! But he gen like he did deserve to win that to win the Norris that year, and it was kind of surprising that the that the they did oh, it right that they did it right. Yeah yeah Espe- like. It, it was. It's always surprising when when award voters actually do the right thing and give their people the right awards. But I digress. All right, let's get out of here on this topic. Uh, the Rangers had third jerseys leaked, announced during the course of last week. First, general thoughts. I mean, they're pretty. They're meh. Like they're not bad, but I don't think they're amazing. Could they make the shield bigger? <laughs> could they? Could they just make it the entire chest next time? Also, also, why is the the A and the C so close to the to the crest? Why the crest is, is it, too big? Why, like the letter is here, the crest like ends here. Yeah. It, you got to separate these two. Either either elevate the the letter even higher, or you got to you got to make the crest a little bit smaller. Like that's kind of, I, I don't I don't like that they're kissing. the The crest, the the logo it, and the letter should not be kissing on the jersey. It's it's not the best. I mean, we saw it uh, two years ago when they put out the reverse retro 1.0 where they quickly realized nobody could read the names on the back because they messed up the font so badly. So maybe that's something that, that we do see get adjusted where one of the letter or the logo ends up getting smaller. Real quick on this subject. Also, the, 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 the stripes? The stripes why, are fine. Why, it's trying okay. to do something different. Right. No, I, I get it. But why are the stripes one way on the arms but a totally different way on the on the bottom that doesn't make that doesn't that doesn't look good no nah, I, I agree with they're fine they're they're not good but they're not terrible there there are worse jerseys in the nhl that, sure. that's the caveat okay to get out of here on this subject of rangers alternate jerseys give me your three favorite rangers alternate jerseys i own a 2018 stadium series jersey the one against buffalo oh, the winter classic yeah. one i should say the one against buffalo that one i really liked um now I have to like quickly look up the heritage, which is the cream. No, not excuse me. The, the heritage, which is the dark blue that they wore against the original six teams during Tortorella and some of in you could do the 2011 winter classic, which is the cream, the 2014 stadium series, which is white, which kind of looks like the Wolfpack Jersey. Um, there's both of the Liberty yeah. reverse retros. I, I do. I do like the, the 2014 outside uh, the the twenty no the twenty twelve one actually that right that was against yeah the, the cream Flyers. ones yeah 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 yeah, cre- yeah 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 the cream one the cream one's really good I'm literally like trying to fi- trying to f- like visually see them all as as my Google search I'm trying to like frantically figure out like what what they all look like uh I like I'm not uh, a lot of these are just kind of okay to me I guess I'll go for the the twenty fourteen ones with like kind of the Yankees theme a little bit i guess those are okay i wouldn't buy it but they're okay hey man those are uh, every now and then a 2014 stadium series jersey with the tag pops up on ebay and it's like 450 because it's mint 10 yeah. years old mint it's crazy how much shit changes on yeah the i'm not mark. buying it but you, you know you enjoy hey have, have a blast with that jersey at minus 450 dollars all right, so real quick, I'll get mine out of the way. Uh, the 2012 Winter Classic against the Flyers, the cream. I like that alternate Rangers logo, which yeah. looks a little more dated. It looks a little more retro. I will go with the Heritage jerseys, the dark blue that said New York and the red across the chest, yeah. the Marion Gabrick, Rick Nash, Derek Stepan ones. And then I got to go with the original Liberty. I, I, I appreciate what they tried to do with the reverse retros. But they overcomplicated it. The first iteration, the 2021 ones, you couldn't read the letters on the back and they had to change them how bad the design was. And then the ones last year, why'd we why'd we make it the regular blue? Isn't the whole point of an alternate jersey to not look like your normal jersey? Also, also, was it so hard to just put stripes on the bottom? Yeah. If you just put the stripes on the bottom, it instantly becomes a really good jersey. Yeah. 
but without without anything on the without anything on the chest except for the logo, it looks like a practice jersey. Yes. If you just add stripes or some kind of alternate patterning on 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 the jersey, it goes from being a practice jersey to oh, this is really cool. But they didn't do that. It looked weird, and I don't I don't know why they decided to that that was that that was definitely one of the choices that they could make, and it was yeah, it was it was one of them. I'll tell you that right now. All right, that'll do it for this week's episode of the Liberty Lou podcast. We will talk to you guys next week. Make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts over on YouTube as well. We're live every Monday, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll see you guys then. Later.